Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to you about how to uh, write a paper for an SP journal. First, let me go ahead and get my screen. We can start the presentation. So uh, to say a little bit about myself, I am a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Oklahoma. I have been publishing in papers for almost 30 years now. And recently I became the editor of Power Engineering and Science, and I will be the editor of the new SPE journal, SP Polymers. So here are, is a list of the SPE journals. Um, oh, the other thing I should have said as well is I will be taking questions at the end if anyone has any questions. Here are a list of the SPE journals, um, uh, Polymer Engineering and Science, which is the first journal started by the organization only about 20 years after we were founded. So it was started in 1961, Polymer Composites in 1980, Journal of Vinyl and Additive Technology in 79. And as I said, we're starting a new journal, uh, SP Polymers in May, 2020. So question might be, why, why, is it, why do we have more than one journal? Well, each of the journals has a little bit different um, purpose, uh, subject matter, et cetera. So, Polymer composites is about composites, um, mixtures of polymers with inorganic fillers. And typically we look for mechanical uh, reinforcing in those particular uh, papers that end up in that, in that journal. Um, journal of Vinyl and Additive Technology was, uh, is uh, focused on additives for polymers, uh, particular for vinyl polymers, but it doesn't have to be vinyl or polymer, it could be any polymer. Uh, but it's focused on the uh, on that part of our industry. Polymer engineering and science uh, sort of is everything else, if you like. Um, uh, that would be that would be of interest to a polymer uh, person, person who's interested in polymer engineering and science. SP polymers is going to be really a, uh, have papers that would fit in all three of those journals. It will be what is called an open access model journal. So in order for you to get a paper from Polymer, if you want to read a paper from Polymer Composites, JVAT, or Polymer Engineering and Science, you either have to be a member of the Society of Plastics Engineers, or you have to be part of an organization that has a subscription to that, that magazine, or you have to pay, it's usually around $30 to $40 for a single article. SP Polymers works on a different business model. In that particular model, the, to publish in the journal, the authors pay to publish in the journal, and then anyone can read the articles for basically for free. So that, it's a different business model. Uh, all of these journals are published by Wiley. Uh, there are partners in this particular uh, endeavor. So SP is not a publishing company. We are a, a knowledge and networking organization, and uh, Wiley helps us with a lot of the um, nuts and bolts of publishing. So you're sitting out there, you say, okay, should I write a paper for an SP journal? What's the question? Um, so in a simple sense, I think any paper has to say, we did X, then Y happened because of Z, okay? So we did something, we saw this result, this change or whatever, and this is why this change happened. Um, so things that I think about, um, uh, that are involved with that is things that, uh, you know, are really, uh, presumably X and Y are pretty straightforward. Uh, typically you may change a structure or you change a filler or you change a, a molecular weight or branch or whatever. And Y happened could be real, rheological, mechanical, electrical, whatever. Uh, and the question is, you know, why did that happen? So really it's about Z and the question, you know, how complete, when I say completeness of Z, meaning that did you look at all the other possible things that could explain why why happened and and is the and have you measured all the things that you need to measure in order to and are they all consistent with your explanation? Um, exclusivity of of Z is it the only explanation? Uh, details about Z, um, you know, what details do you have that that this is what's actually happening? And I, I oversimplified this a little bit. Yeah, sometimes it turns out that you don't really know. You don't have a you know, even if you're explaining, you're not sure your explanation is correct. That's usually okay. Um, I 
think you have to have some idea though. What, why did these things happen? I don't think it's enough to say we did X, then Y happened. I don't think that most, that would, that would not get you published. You have to have some idea of why. And the other part that, that is, can be important is I call it who cares, novelty and or importance. Um, uh, to give you a specific example, I recently rejected a paper because the results that they presented were specific to one material. It had no uh, uh, application that I could see to a different material. And the reviewers helped with this as well, to a different material. And um, uh, there was no generalities that came out of it. And that, and that material wasn't of any particular importance. At least it wasn't of any importance that the authors noted, right? So I basically said, hey, if you could get three or four of these types of materials and show the same thing, then I think it, it becomes something that is publishable. But with only one material, you can't, you know, you can't draw any generalities from it. So um, it's really not something that I can say is important because I don't know if all these other materials which are similar have this property. So um, anything that you publish can't be published elsewhere. Abstracts and presentations or meetings don't count as publications and that includes Antec paper. So you can publish an Antec paper and still publish in the SP journal. Uh, I say not published elsewhere. There is a thesis exemption. Uh, it is if you have a MS or PhD thesis, which has been published, it is still possible to publish in the SPE journal. So thesis doesn't count as a, as a publication. Uh, there's actually a special rule about this. I won't get into this here, but it's actually a special, there's a special exemption given. Um, why should you publish? Um, for us academics, if you wanna keep your job, then you need to uh, publish. Uh, it is a form of networking. Uh, people will find out uh, what you're doing. Uh, I certainly, I've had people that I've met at meetings saying, oh, you're that person because I've read your papers. And that's always a really nice thing to have happen. Um, and frankly, it's uh, also helps secure your intellectual contributions in the field. Um, it's a really can help you, you know, if uh, you're known as being published in X area that makes you an expert, um, assuming that your publication is, is accurate and people think, wow, that person knows what he or she is talking about. So, so um, the first step in, uh, uh, in if you say, okay, I think I have a paper. Here I have my story I'm gonna tell. The question is, has someone else told your story? <laughs> and there's two parts to this. One is you have to be able to put your story in context with everyone else's story, right? So uh, you need to, if there's a context that's important here. Um, and, uh, the, I recommend the Google Scholar Web of Science. Um, it's all about how good is your literature ser search? You know, what's, what else is out there? Uh, this, is, this is something that is really, really important. And uh, you need to it, put context if your paper is really important. Where, where, where does my conclusion fit in with everybody else does? Sometimes you might be the first person to work in an area and you say, hey, nobody else has done this. The sentence that I use is, you know, According to uh, as far uh, um, as far as I can tell, I don't use those words. As far as I can tell, um, you know, we're the first ones to do this, right? And uh, you know, um, and then hopefully, if you're not, somebody will catch it and point out to you, "Hey, you missed this paper." And that's always embarrassing, but it does happen. It happened to me. Uh, it's happened to me once, and I was like, "Oh, that's not good." But um, uh, it does happen, and unfortunately, but uh, you know, you you want to be sure to try to make sure you get all the papers that are relevant to your paper. This is not a small undertaking. Um, it's too expensive to individually purchase articles. Um, so it is something that you really have to spend some time on and make sure, you know, typically I would say, uh, you know, if I had to put an hours on it, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 20, 20 to 40 hours, you're going to spend looking at papers and searching and reading and just say, okay, now I know where this fits and making sure that nobody else has done that. Uh, there is a very famous adage, which is, you know, an afternoon save six months in the lab. So really, before you do something, you should really make sure that nobody else has done it. Because one of the worst things in the world is to realize somebody else has done something that you've you that you've um, uh, um, that you you think is new to what you've done. So um, there is another type of, of article. Um, I've only up to this point I've described articles which are. Um, um, uh, based on original research, there is a type called a review article. 
Um, and the, the review articles are really great because you learn about something, right? You don't have to be an expert to do a review. That's one of the things that people think that's just not true. Um, you can, by reading, if you read enough papers, you can, be, you can become an expert. Um, and uh, the idea, I think, what I tell people is it's best to limit the scope, but be complete. You don't want to be incomplete. It's best to be as complete as possible, but limit the scope. So choose something that's narrow enough that you can um, write something that is, is um, you know, complete, but limited in scope. I would say any decent review paper is going to have at least 100 papers for reference, maybe more, uh, probably somewhere between 100 and 500, depending on how, how um uh, um, uh, you know, complete you know, how big of an area, what your scope is. Um, critical review is a little different. That requires expertise, um, which is the paper that I showed up here. This was actually a paper that I did uh, about 10 years ago in polymer engineering science. Uh, and I, if you're going to write a review paper, I generally recommend that you contact the editor first. Is this something of interest? To do a review paper, honestly, is just as much work to do an original paper, meaning that if you add up all the time that you have to spend in the lab to do the work and then um, and then do the review paper, it's the times aren't too much different. It's just that for a review paper, you're you're just doing all you're doing is reading and reading and reading and and finding and looking and summarizing and everything. So it's it's not a trivial amount of work, but you really do learn about something. I mean, certainly the subjects that I consider myself the most expert in are the ones I've written review papers about. All right, so you're ready. You, you figured out what you're, you you got all your experiments done, or you're ready to start writing your review paper or whatever. So then you say, okay, what do I need to do? Well, um, first step is to read the journal instructions. I read read those in advance. Um, it helps you coordinate your uh, paper. Uh, you don't want to wait till the end and say and then realize you have to do a bunch of work to try to conform to their uh, references. Um, the reference format, uh, the sections that you need for your paper, those sorts of things, you don't wanna have to mess with that at the end. Uh, one thing I will say about, I say figures and tables embedded in the text. Um, typically what I'll do is I'll actually not embed them until the end because, and I'll, I'll actually I'll have them in a separate file because it's just too much of a pain to, to put them in the, embed them in the text otherwise. So I'll typically have those in, a, in its own file. And then at the last step, I'll put them in the, in the in the uh, in the paper before I submit. So, um, and you see the page here from our particular um, uh, uh, web page for Palmer Engineering and Science. Contribute then author guidelines, and there's a list of things you have to read it. So, all right. Um, I want to say a couple steps here. A couple things about steps. One is um, you don't want to type in. Uh, you don't want to have to keep track of references. Uh, manually as as much as possible, at least the numbering. So I recommend that you either use the word footnote endnote feature. So in in publications, the the references are always at the end. Use the MS Word endnote feature or a program called endnote, which is what I use. There may be some other programs that you can use. Uh, the reason that you want to do this, um, these all uh, the these all allow um, the the numbering to be automatic. Um, and if you want to read, like use cross-referencing, that is you've already referenced something, you need to reference it again, use cross-referencing. And you don't want to type in numbers manually. That just is way too much effort and it's real easy to make a mistake. So just use one of those, whatever you're familiar with. EndNote does cost money. I, you know, I don't know. I, if I were not going to do this a lot, then I might just use the EndNote feature. Certainly the I tell my students in when they do their capstone projects, um, I say just use the EndNote feature uh, in Word. Don't worry about using this other program called that noter. So, um, and a question I get asked a lot is where should I start writing? And I, and I always tell people wherever you're most comfortable. I don't, I've actually started at different places. I think the only place I've never started is the conclusions. Um, but I've started with the abstract. I've started with the experimental. I've started with the results and discussion. It's just whatever you feel, wherever you feel that, that you want to start. Uh, do I outline? No, but some people do. Uh, I don't know. I mean, this is sort of a stylistic thing. Uh, I think that um, it's whatever you make sense to whatever, you know, one of the things I like to do too is do the easy, easiest part first. So uh, that gets me going. So um, this is something that I put together. Um, you can see the, the, the link here. Um, this was published in something, a, a journal called Chemical Engineering Education, uh, that sort of the tips of, for writing. And I have to give 
uh, the wife of our current president, Brian Land, is a shout out because when I did this the first time I showed it to her, so she, she is a technical writer and she made me she made some comments. Um, uh, you certainly can read that. Um, the, the key things that I sort of, you know, the four four points that I think that come up the most, I've summarized it here. There's a lot more in that that one page document. Um, don't use their it or this as a noun. They're not, um, you, you, the reason you don't use their or it is because um, you can typically make uh, sentences shorter if you don't. You don't use this as a noun because it's almost for sure you don't know what this is referring to, so don't use it. Use as few words as possible, but never be ambiguous. Technical writing, you wanna be as, as short and uh, use as few words as you can, but you cannot ever be ambiguous. If you're gonna be ambiguous, then you have to use more words. You don't repeat yourself. This is something I find a lot is people will say, if you ever, see one of the a rule of thumb, and I don't remember who told me this, is if you ever want to say in other words, ask yourself, why don't you say it that way the first time? Um, uh, the, you will, of course, repeat yourself in the abstract conclusions because you're going to be um, uh, um, uh, restating ideas. When I say don't repeat yourself, I don't mean words. I mean ideas. You don't need to say the same idea two or three times. Similarly, if, if I can read it in a table or see it in a figure, you don't need to tell me that this is what was in that figure or table. Now, you might want to say, as shown in figure X, this measurement which set with this, this, this goes up because of Y, right? Um, this goes up part isn't really important. The because of Y part is important, right? But you have to set that up and that's okay. Um, the, the other thing that I found, um, except for a very few people, the best way to write is to write something and then forget about it and then edit it and then forget about it and then edit it. Um, if you have someone else that can look at it that is a good writer, um, you can certainly do that as well. I should point out that uh, there are people in our world that are really good writers. I am not one of them. I used to require writing in my uh, chemical engineering undergrad class. And I, I probably had, I probably had about somewhere say a neighborhood of probably 250 students, there's one person there that could actually write. I mean, it was like, well, this person can actually write. Um, uh, it, 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 is, I, it is something that some people you read them and you say, well, that person can actually write. Uh, most of us aren't, aren't blessed with that skill. We can write satisfactorily, but we can't really write. Can't write something that is just, is beautiful. Rules of thumb, uh, 10 double spaced pages of text minimum, 20 maximum, nothing less than 10 font um, so people can see it. Uh, grayscale or color figures. Um, grayscale in general, if you're gonna use a print journal, um, uh, they'll charge you for color. So I tell people to stay away from color. I use grayscale to distinguish between different uh, sets of data. Uh, People will use color because if it, when it's an online version, you can see the color. The problem is you better just be sure that that in the print version, which is going to be black and white, unless you want to pay the money, um, that you can tell, distinguish between data. Um, now, how many people still look at the print journal? That's a different print journal. That's a different question. Um, one thing I really like, uh, and I've done this many times in my papers, and I think other people should do it more, is if you have data that you're comparing with other papers, then Put a, set up a table and say, okay, here's what we did. Here's what they found. Here's what we, you know, here's what we did. Here's what they did. Here's what they did. Here's what they did. And you can sort of, sort of see the differences. And it really helps the reader, I think, understand where your data fit, where your study fits and what others have done. Um, avoid relative words like best, better, et cetera, because better, I mean, I, I don't know how many times I see the words better mechanical properties. I'm like, okay, some, what does that mean, right? Because some cases you want more flexibility in your mechanical properties. In some cases you want more stiffness in your mechanical properties. So it, it, it doesn't make any sense. Now you guys could say better mechanical, better mechanical properties for stiffness, but then once you just say higher stiffness, right? So um, it, it's, a, it's something that in scientific literature, you just don't usually want to use um, because it depends, you know, sometimes some one property is better in some applications and sometimes yeah, the opposite is better in some applications. Um, this is, um, um, there's many screens to follow, submission of article. Um, I, there's many screens you have to follow. Um, honestly, I put, this is a pain. Uh, I submission of article is something that takes a long time and there's lots of things you have to fill out. Typically, it probably takes me uh, two hours to submit an article. 
Um, you do need to examine your final proof. You'll, they'll, you'll submit everything and they'll send you back. You have to look at a PDF file. Be sure to look at it. Sometimes I, it is very frustrating, but sometimes the conversion's not perfect and you, and you may end up having to submit a PDF file. I don't usually like to do that. Personally submitting a PDF file, I prefer to submit a Word file. But sometimes I'll I'll do that, and because PDF translators are all a little different, and that that can be an issue. Um, you need three suggested reviewers with contact uh, information. Uh, I hope people appreciate my picture there on the right. Um, the don't choose the three stooges. Uh, I think that um, people that you've met, it's very helpful. I think it puts people in a good. Oh yeah, okay, I know who that person is. I think it puts them in a good frame of mind. Obviously, there are people that need to be experts in your area. Um, uh, people that cite your papers is really good, and people that have that you've cited in your paper are also very good. Um, I can tell you that typically most editors do not choose all three reviewers uh, that you suggest to review your paper. I would say the average is probably one um, uh, because there's you want to make sure as an editor you want people that are going to you know the concern is if if you if it's somebody who's your friend, then they might review your paper, even though it's not any good. Now, again, I don't think, I hope nobody in the audience would do that, but I can tell you that we typically, um, I'd say one of the reviewers typically is contacted. So, um, this is the uh, return. This is the bang in your head. Uh, I like that. I chose that one special uh, because sometimes you'll get a reviewers um, uh, that you'll be like, what in the world are they saying? And, and so that's okay. Um, uh, read the reviews care, responses carefully. My review, my, my, if the reviewer says you should do X, I generally do X unless the reviewer is wrong. And I'll say, I'll respond, the reviewer is wrong. And the editor will read this, right? So if you're wrong, then, and you respond that the reviewer is wrong, the reviewer is right, that you're probably going to get your paper rejected. Okay. Um, and the other thing that I think you I've used is, you know, you should do X. Well, yes, you're right. That would be helpful, but it would, it's just take a long time and we don't have the equipment to do it or whatever. And I think most of the time the editor will say that's okay. Now, if it's something that's going to take you a day, then you need to go off and do it. If something's going to take you six months, that's different. Um, it's really important that you do a point by point discussion to the, whatever the reviewer tells you, you know, we did. And sometimes you say, agree we did this right um and that's fine uh and so you know and you have to explain right and and i think it's really important although sometimes i will admit myself that i just want to say you're stupid um no you can't do that you have to be you know polite and everything um uh, because this is you know you spend a lot of work on this and and it's very very frustrating if you get something that you didn't agree with. Um, but on the other hand, many times you'll get a review and you'll be like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> or, oh, I didn't think of that, you know, and, and that's really good because it helps improve your paper. I mean, most reviewers are really trying to improve your paper, right? I mean, the point of review is to make your paper better. And so, um, uh, you know, keep that in mind as you do your response and, and be professional. And so, all right, uh, I did put the slide in here for some of you that will be asked to be reviewers. Um, a, um, a good review is something which is specific. Um, you know, don't say, uh, the more general the statement is, the less use it is um, to, the, to the author. Be as specific as possible. Your job as a reviewer is not to be an English editor. If the English is bad, it's certainly fine to just say, there's lots of English things that need to be fixed in this and the editor, it's up to the editor to take care of those. Um, I think, you know, one of the things when I first started being a reviewer, I wouldn't reject papers. I felt bad. Um, as I've gotten older, I've gotten a lot more cynical and I'm much more willing to reject a paper now than I was when I first started. Go ahead and reject the paper. If there's errors, reject it. Say, this is an error. Um, I'm rejecting this paper. It's not your responsibility to, um, uh, uh, you know, fix somebody else's error. Uh, one thing that's, that's important is if you think something is too long, there's a big push to make articles shorter. Um, uh, so shortening if possible, nobody wants to read an article that's longer than it needs to be. Uh, and finally, um, your tone, you want your tone to be helpful. Um, you're not trying to you know, make somebody else feel bad. You're just trying to help them make have a better paper. But like I said, don't be afraid to reject the paper. Um, uh, if, you, if you really feel like there's errors in it, then just say I rejected paper for these specific errors. 
So, um, I wonder if anybody in the the uh, um, uh, understands what this picture is. Uh, I'm an Everton fan, so uh, if that means anything to anyone in the audience, um, the uh, the reason I chose this picture is because sometimes you get your galley proofs. So basically you've submitted your paper, it's been accepted. Uh, it's now been typeset into a, the format it will appear in in the journal. Um, and it, you're given a chance to look at the proofs to make any corrections. Um, uh, sometimes when you read your proofs, you'll make uh, really, you'll realize, oh my gosh, what was I thinking when I wrote that sentence? And you just want to change the whole sentence. Um, you're not supposed to do that, but it, I've always been of the opinion that you can change a sentence if you, it's really bad. However, you're really not editing this, right? You're looking for errors. So it's not something you want to do very often, but you know, if it's really bad, change it. Um, so, uh, and then there'll be questions that the, that the, you'll be asked that you need to answer um, that the, you know, certain figures may, they may not understand something or whatever. Um, and you're looking for typeset errors as well. So um um it's it's it is oh the other thing i should have i point out here typically you'll given be given like 72 hours or something if you're not going to make the 72 hour time frame email them and say hey can i have more time right it's that's okay right don't don't you know because what will happen is if you don't then you'll you'll just assume you don't have any changes and just publish it without your changes so it's okay to ask for more time if you need it but it is something that they want you to do quickly um so questions, I, let me see, do we have any questions? You can use the Q&A or the chat. Wow. All right. Oh, there we go. Yeah, the crucial, the issue of novelty with a paper. So thanks for the nice talk. Sometimes there's an issue of novelty with a paper. Can you comment on that? Yeah, it, it is the responsibility of the author to make a paper now to tell the reader and the editor why the paper is novel. Right? Why is it some? Why is it something that has not been done before? And and sometimes, ideally, um, you know, it's your responsibility as an author to do that. And that means that you have to be familiar with the literature and say, okay, here's what all these other people have done, you know, over here. But here is what these this this is why ours is different. That's that's really really important, and that's your responsibility as as an author. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I can tell you that I think in most journals, if that if there's a disagreement between you and the, the reviewers and the editor, that is something that you can talk to the editor about. And uh, many times editors will will talk to a different editor to see if they're being unreasonable. But it, you have to you have to do that yourself. That's it's your responsibility. Okay, well, um, I don't see any other questions. So we have about another 10 minutes.